Brothers and sisters, would you open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6? Specifically to verses 10 through 20, which you, I hope, will recall from last week is Paul's last major installment in this letter of instruction for gospel living in light of gospel truth. We've come a long way with Paul through this letter to the Ephesians, and now we're landing at the last thing that is profoundly important for him as he encourages these believers in Ephesus and through them us about what it means to live in light of the fact that we have a Savior in Jesus Christ. We are learning about the Christian life as warfare. The Christian life as battle. Last Sunday, Paul gave us our threat brief. That means he told us about our adversary. We have a real adversary. We have real enemies, plural. And these enemies are in the heavenly places. That means the spiritual realm. Our adversary is the devil, Satan, and it is those spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, demons, who are associated with him, allied with him. Paul told us in verse 12 of Ephesians 6, We do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. These are real beings, and they are set against God and against God's people. And that means then that following Jesus is a life of battle. Why? Well, obviously because we have enemies, but couldn't God just like flick them with his finger and be done with them? Why is the Christian life a life of battle? It's because it's for our good. We know that, don't we, from the Apostle Paul? That everything God does is good and everything God does is for the good of his people. So this battle, this Christian life that is a battle is for our good. It's for God's glory and God's glory is our good. God is glorified when his people resist Satan. And when God is glorified, anytime God is glorified, his people are blessed. That's the beautiful joining of the gospel between God in his glory and his people in their good. It's no mistake that the Christian life is a life of battle. It's actually by design. It's for our sanctification. That means our being made holy as Jesus is holy. Listen to Paul in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. Paul says, We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope, and hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Last Sunday, we considered the threat, the enemy. Today, we're going to listen closely to the command. I'm going to read our whole passage again. That means verses 10 through 20. And then we're going to walk verse by verse through verse 10 and verse 11 and verse 13. Would you read with me? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation 
and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints, and also for me that my words may be given that words may be given to me in opening my mouth boldly to proclaim the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that I may declare it boldly as I ought to speak. Would you pray with me? Father, please help us this morning. We don't come to these words lightly. We do not come to them in our own strength. Rather, we come acknowledging our weakness to you. And even rejoicing in it, because if anything happens this morning through the preaching of your word, it's only because your Holy Spirit's going to work. And I pray he would. In Jesus' name, amen. Paul says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And if you recall from last week, that's Paul's general exhortation in this last bit of instruction about Christian living. This is the command that he's going to make more specific in a moment as we go along. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. That command is overwhelming. In fact, it's massively overwhelming. And before I highlight why it is, I just want to first note, and this is off notes now, but it occurred to me as I was sitting down there singing, this command is not only overwhelming, it's profoundly personal for us this morning. And I mean personal as in down to the very, like, fabric of this service. Have you noticed the theme that's been running from start to finish? And none of us who've been a part of arranging this service were smart enough to put this together in the way that it's happened. I opened with Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6, which is all about God's wisdom and not our own. We sang about Christ as our rock. And then Steve came and brought us to Isaiah 40. And did you notice the ridiculous juxtaposition in Isaiah 40 between idols that are lifeless and worthless and the living God who says, if you wait on me, I will restore your what? your strength, your power. And now here we are in Ephesians 6. And verse 10 says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. You know what that makes me think this morning? It makes me think that someone sitting in this service this morning needs to be strengthened in the Lord today. And, and not just in some generic, yes, we all need that every day as Christians kind of way, but you actually really need it this morning. It probably means we need it as a church this morning. So you better pay attention. If you don't, shame on you, your loss. This command is overwhelming. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. And it's overwhelming because Paul's exhortation means that you need something, I need something outside of us. Something beyond our control. Something that isn't ours. This command is not about you being good enough. It's not about you being strong enough. You need strength in order to do battle with the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And guess what? You don't have it. Not only do you not have this strength, it's also not something that you could get up out of the pew, walk across the street to Safeway, and go buy it off the shelf. It's not there. And even if it was, you don't have enough money in the world to buy it. This is not something that you can wish up, something that you can will up. It's not something that you bring to yourself by just sort of flipping a switch or deciding in your own mind that I'm just going to be strong today. No, what you need is an alien strength. That means a strength outside of yourself, a strength that is not your own, a strength that is given to you, a strength that is opened to you, a strength that is gifted to you. You need the strength of the Lord. And realize that when Paul says this, you need the strength of the Lord, he means quite literally the strength of Jesus Christ. When Paul uses Lord in Ephesians, invariably, he's referring to Jesus. 
You need the strength of the one whom Paul told us in Ephesians 1, God the Father raised from the dead and seated at the right hand, his, at his right hand, the Father's right hand, in the heavenly places, far above all rule and all authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named. That's the strength of the one of whom Paul writes that God the Father put all things under his feet and gave him as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. That is Jesus, and that's the strength that you need. It's his strength that you need. Now think about that for a moment. Think about the power of Jesus and think about the power of Jesus as we encounter it in the Gospels. Just let your mind run for a moment over all those accounts of Jesus that we have in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John and think about the power of Jesus. The power of Jesus calmed storms with just a word. The power of Jesus healed people with just a word and even less than a word. The power of Jesus raised the dead multiple times. The power of Jesus literally laid waste to the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. When Jesus came onto the scene, demons cowered in fear, and at his word they left oppressed people over and over and over again, time and time again. That's the power that you need, literally, desperately. That's the power you need in order to stand against the schemes of the devil. We need the power of Jesus Christ, and we need the power of Jesus, again, not in some generic sense, not in some random sense. We need the power of Jesus as the divine warrior. We're talking in the context of warfare with Paul here in Ephesians 6. We need the power of Jesus as the God-man who is the divine warrior. That sort of power is on display in Psalm 18. Listen to verses 13 through 19 of Psalm 18. And, and get the picture of the Lord as the divine warrior. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered His voice, hailstones and coals of fire. And He sent out His arrows and scattered them. That means the enemies coming against God's people. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare at Your rebuke, O Lord, at the blast of the breath of Your nostrils. He sent from on high, he took me, he drew me out of many waters, he rescued me from my strong enemy and from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They confronted me in the day of my calamity, but the Lord was my support. He brought me out into a broad place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Without that power, you will fall. Without that power, I will fall. You and I will both fall every single time that we come against our enemy without that power. Paul's command, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might, it overwhelms us. And it overwhelms us not only because it requires the divine strength of Jesus... It also overwhelms us because of what this command promises. Right? Think about it. Think about what's true. If this command can come true, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. If that command can happen, if it can be realized, if you can be strengthened with the power that belongs to Jesus, then think about what you're receiving. 
you're receiving the strength that belongs to the one whom God promised back in Genesis 3.15 would come. The strength of the offspring of the woman Eve, whom God said would bruise the head of the serpent, Satan. The one who would crush the head of the devil. That means that if verse 10 can actually happen, if this command from Paul can actually be realized, then my personal battle against Satan or the battle of this church against Satan is a done deal. If verse 10 can happen, then Satan will flee from me, James chapter 4. If this command can happen, then he will, Satan will, be crushed beneath my feet. Romans chapter 16, verse 20. Okay, so that begs the question. Can this command happen? Can what Paul exhorts come to pass? Can the power of the risen Lord Jesus Christ actually be mine? Well, brothers and sisters, that's one of those sort of rhetorical questions because the Bible never commands something that can't finally be obeyed by God's people. In other words, what the Bible commands, what God commands, can always be obeyed finally by God's people. Paul's exhortation here in verse 10 would just be cruel. It would be like futile toying with us if it wasn't for the fact that what he commands, he says, based on what is already done. What is already a reality. Did you catch the last statement when I was reading from Ephesians 1 verse 23 just a little bit ago? Did you catch the last statement about Jesus? Paul said that God gave Jesus as the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all and all. That means if you're a part of the church through your faith in Jesus Christ, then you're part of him. You've been joined to Him. You're united with Him. And thus, His power, Jesus' power, the power that you absolutely need and must have if you're going to do battle with your spiritual enemy, that power is for you. It's yours. Already. It's already given. The power is not yours as from you. It's not inside you. That's why our 20th and 21st century look inside yourself to figure out how to do life nonsense is such nonsense. And if I was in a different setting, I'd use a stronger word that would offend everybody for what it is. But this power is not from you. It is for you. Because you've been united to Jesus. In Christ, God has already made us alive out of the deadness to sin. He has already raised us up with Him and already seated us with Him in the heavenly places. That's Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. And when Paul writes there, he's writing in the past tense. Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father, and guess what? Everyone who has been united to Jesus by grace through faith in Him is also in God's sight seated right there with Christ. Far above all rule and power. Far above every name that is named both in this age and in the age to come. God's purpose for you in Christ is that you would know the immeasurable greatness of His power toward us who believe. That also is Ephesians chapter 1. The same power that God worked in Jesus when He raised Him from the dead. The power of Jesus Christ for you is one of the blood-bought promises of the cross. It's one of the glorious consequences of the fact that Jesus died for you. 
Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Paul gives that command based on what's real for people in Jesus. And that means then that this command can be obeyed. There is a pathway to obedience when God commands you to be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. What's the pathway? How can we obey? How, how can we be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might? Well, the answer is verse 11. The answer is put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The phrase put on is a middle voice verb in Greek. And that just means that you have a role to play in this strengthening process. There is a doing of faith that is necessary to being strong in the Lord. You will be strengthened with the power that is yours in Jesus, the power of Jesus that is for you. You will be strengthened in that as you in faith through a will that God has made free, put on the whole armor of God. Paul pictures being strong in the Lord as preparing yourself for battle, for warfare. Why? Because we have an enemy. Because we have enemies and you don't face an enemy unprepared. Put on the whole armor of God. Now last week I had you do the thought experiment of picturing yourself as a fighter pilot. This week, we're going to shift the illustration just a little bit. And this morning, I want you to picture a SWAT team. A law enforcement special weapons and tactics team. Picture a SWAT team crouched at the door of a house. And they're ready to burst into that house and raid it. Because inside, there's an evil adversary and he's holding hostages. Now, I use that illustration quite intentionally. Because in that illustration, the SWAT team are the aggressors. The SWAT team is on the offensive, not the defensive. They have a rescue mission, and they mean to get that mission done. Sometimes when we come to Ephesians 6 and we start thinking about this thing called spiritual warfare, we begin to picture the church or we begin to picture Christians or we even begin to picture ourselves as beleaguered warriors who are merely on the defensive. We're sort of just barely hanging on against Satan and his schemes. Now, in all honesty, sometimes life feels like that. Sometimes life looks like that, but that kind of picture is not finally how Jesus spoke about his people. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 18, Peter speaks to Jesus, and he's speaking, I'm sorry, uh, Jesus speaks to Peter, and Jesus is speaking to Peter here as the representative of the church that's going to come, and Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That kind of statement presumes something. It presumes that the church is on the offensive against the gates of hell. It's a picture of the church storming the gates of hell. We're raiding the house of the strong man, as it were. That's Luke 11. And we're doing it in order to rescue hostages that are being held captive by Satan to do his will. Paul's writing to Christians in Ephesus about the whole armor of God precisely because the kingdom of God has successfully invaded this city and the bastion of darkness that was previously there. This is not about the people of God merely hunkering down and weathering a storm. This is about the people of God on the offensive for the glory of God. Now, if you were to look at this SWAT team in our illustration, if you were just to picture them and observe them, you'd find them geared up and ready to go. 
You'd find them with pants belted on and with boots laced up. And you'd find them with body armor vests thrown over their shoulders and cinched down. You'd see them with helmets on and with rifles in hand. And, and you'd see them postured behind a ballistic shield. They are ready to go. And the adversary that's inside that house, he's not going to stand when this team goes through that door. That's how you do business with the enemy. Where did the Apostle Paul get his image of a warrior armored up for battle? Well, certainly Paul's drawing here in part from the Roman soldiers of his day that he was so familiar with because he had relationships with many of them. He's, he's got to be drawing in part from that. But, but listen, Paul perhaps is taking the image even more fundamentally from the Old Testament. Maybe from a place like Isaiah 59, verse 17, where the prophet writes this. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. And he put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Who's the he in that verse? The he is God. God is the divine warrior. This image in Ephesians 6 is all about being strengthened with the armor that God supplies. And every piece of armor that we're going to look at in weeks to come, comes from God. Do you know what happens when you take up and put on the armor of Jesus Christ the armor supplied by him, him who is the divine warrior. Do you know what happens when you do that? You too become a warrior. When you gear yourself up for battle, you are geared up as a warrior. You become a warrior in God's army. You are strengthened against the enemy that you have, whether you like it or not. Let me show you what that looks like. We saw God as the divine warrior. Let me show you what it looks like to be strengthened in the likeness of that God. And here I'm going back to Psalm 18 once more, and I'm going to start in verse 31. For who is God but the Lord? And who is a rock except our God? The God who equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. He made my feet like the feet of a deer and set me secure on the heights. He trains my hands for war so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. You have given me the shield of your salvation and your right hand supported me and your gentleness made me great. You gave me a wide place for my steps under me and my feet did not slip. I pursued my enemies and overtook them and did not turn back till they were consumed. I thrust them through so that they were not able to rise. They fell under my feet. For you equipped me with strength for the battle. You made those who rise against me sink under me. You made my enemies turn their backs to me. Thus, or in that way, are Jesus' people strengthened. And we're strengthened not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Now before we press on to verse 13, I want to emphasize something, and this is just reaching for the the direct application of this to the Christian life. Brothers and sisters, it is profoundly important for you and I to realize and believe that a spiritual battle with spiritual enemies needs spiritual armor. Now, on the one hand, that seems quite obvious from this passage, like no duh. That's the whole point that Paul's writing for. But practically speaking, I think that point is sometimes lost on us as the church. 
And I'm going I'm to just say something a little bit provocative, but please realize I don't mean it to be wholly provocative, but, but sometimes we sort of think that maybe I can medicate my way out of a spiritual battle. Or maybe I can therapy my way out of a spiritual battle. Now again, I, I want to be really careful in saying that. I'm trying to say something important without saying something definitive about medicine all the time or in every case or something definitive about therapy in general. I'm just trying to say that sometimes as God's people, we encounter difficult things in life, even emotional things or spiritual things, mental things, physical things, and we tend to look everywhere except to God's Word and how we deal with what we're facing that's hard. And if you believe that you have an enemy, that you actually do battle with spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places, then part of your thought process as a Christian ought to be when things are hard in life, Lord, what's going on? Is there a battle here that I'm not aware of, that I need to be? Battling our adversary is often hard. It's mentally hard. It's sometimes long. It's emotionally draining. It's even physically difficult. And all of that in the goodness of God. And when things get hard in our life, there's a temptation often to want to just fix it. We want that light switch. Can I just move that switch from hard to easy? Or can someone do that for me? We want to move past the moment. What does Isaiah 40 say? Those who wait on the Lord. There's a temptation to ignore the means of strength given to us by our Savior who knows far better than you and I will ever come close to knowing what it means to do battle. You don't wrestle a spiritual enemy by ignoring spiritual armor. Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 3 and 4, Though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We have a spiritual enemy. And we have a problem of sin. And for both, Jesus Christ is the answer. Now in verse 12, which we addressed last week, Paul describes our enemy in detail. And then in verse 13, he repeats the command that we've just considered. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. That's Paul repeating the command once again. But notice... Notice the second half of verse 13. Notice the expanded reason that Paul gives us for being strong in the Lord. Take up the armor of God, the full armor of God. Why? What's the reason? So that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. I alluded to it last week, but, but I think that is one of my favorite statements in the whole of the Bible. When I read that verse from the Apostle Paul, from God through the Apostle Paul, I, I imagine an embattled warrior, or better, warriors plural, embattled warriors plural, and they're fighting, <clears throat> and they're struggling, and they're straining. And when the smoke clears, and when the din of the battle ceases, when it fades away, the enemy is gone. He's nowhere to be seen, but this group of warriors is still there. They're holding the ground. They're still standing. The battlefield is theirs. They are victorious. I want us to observe three things about this reason Paul gives for taking up the whole armor of God. Take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. There's three observations I want to make, and with each one, I'm going I'm to apply it. 
Okay, so I want us to see what Paul's saying, and I want us to see an application from it. First, Paul says, do this, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Well, look, observe, there's an assumption in that statement. And the assumption is, Paul's assumption is, that we're living in evil days. Paul has that same assumption in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 16. We talked about it when we were in that passage. Paul has the same assumption in Galatians chapter 1, verse 4. In 2 Timothy 2, chapter 3, I'm sorry, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Paul writes and he says this, he says, Understand, Timothy, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, tough stuff in the last days. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of godliness but denying its power. That's a description of evil days. And listen, when Paul says that the day is evil, I think he means something far more specific than simply saying that the day is evil because it's marked by sin, because that's been true for every day, reaching all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Every day is evil in the sense that it's been marked by sin. But when Paul says specifically here that the day is evil, he means something more. I think he means that we are in a specific period in which the expression of evil on the earth is especially intense and it's increasingly intense. Why do I think that? I think that because something substantive changed in the cosmos with the death and resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul refers to the last days because we have entered the last era of history in the world as we know it. And in this era, Satan has been cast down so as to rage in his final feudal rebellion against God. That's what has substantively changed in the cosmos since the death and resurrection and ascension of Jesus Christ. Satan has been cast down. That's the weight, I think, of Revelation chapter 12, verse 17, when it depicts Satan as the dragon who is kicked out of heaven and who now makes war on all those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. We have an enemy. Brothers and sisters, it behooves us to know the times. According to God's word, it behooves us to know the times in which we live according to God's word and to let that knowledge define our expectations and to let that knowledge sober us for godly joy in godly living in ungodly times. That means we shouldn't be surprised. We shouldn't be tempted to despair when we encounter evil in the world, when we bump up against it, when it hits us in the face. Some days are more evil than others because some days our battle against the adversary is more intense than on another day. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ this morning, expect, expect, Plan on periods in your life when for your good, in His glory, God is going to lead you into a particular struggle with Satan. The Holy Spirit did that for Jesus. And if you're following Jesus, you can expect the same thing. Right now, in today, resolve now not to despair when that kind of evil day comes. Resolve not to despair, but to depend 
prepare now not to despair in that kind of especially intense evil day, but rather to depend. And when that period of intense battle comes, when you're walking through a day and you're like, man, the Lord is showing me this battle's intense today. This day is a black day in my life. When you find yourself in that moment, don't waste your time wishing for the good old days. Rather, anticipate what's coming. Anticipate the day of the Lord when Jesus returns. And underneath that, anticipate the day of near relief when God leads you out of the valley of the shadow of death. Even before Jesus returns, that valley doesn't last forever. Evil days don't continue forever. Our second observation here is just to notice the juxtaposition between two types of standing in verse 13. Paul says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. That, that's one type of standing. That's a standing against. And having done all to stand firm, that's another type of standing. That's a standing in, a standing on. We have two types of standing in verse 13. We stand against the evil day in order to stand in victory when the battle's over. We stand against evil because we stand in Christ. Now, perhaps you've heard Christians, and especially Christians who exercise some sort of public voice in opposition to things, perhaps you've heard Christians criticized for always being against something and never for something. Ah, you Christians, you're, you're always against something in a negative sense, and you're never for something in a positive sense. And if we get really sort of self-flagellating about it, we start telling ourselves, well, shucks. We really shouldn't be known so much for what we stand against. We, we really should be known more on the basis of what we stand for. That's kind of how the criticism goes. And too often we sort of take that and we put it on our shoulders. But listen, brothers and sisters, that is a false dichotomy. It's false. We ought to be known both for what we stand against and what we stand for. And the latter, what we stand for, ought to fuel the former, what we stand against. Because I stand redeemed in Jesus Christ, therefore I stand against the evil of my day. Because I stand redeemed in Christ, storming the gates of hell, as it were, therefore, I stand against the lie of transgenderism. Or against the sin, or sins plural, of sexual immorality. Or against the evil of abortion. Or the deceit of material ambition, or against, most importantly, perhaps, the arrogance of my own heart. Because I stand redeemed in Christ, therefore, I stand against the evil of my culture by seeking to build up the better world, the real world. The coming world that is God's kingdom beginning in Jesus' church. Your investment in this church is part and parcel of standing against the evil day. And when the dust settles, and when the evil day ceases, guess who's going to be on the field still? Christ's church. And by God's grace, you'll be standing with it. Finally, last observation. Notice what Paul says about standing or about how we stand. He says that we stand having done all. 
Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Putting on the full armor of God to stand in the evil day is an active thing. It's not a passive thing. It's an active defense. What does Paul mean when he says, having done all? Well, doesn't he mean that this Christian life, this life of battling Satan, is one of holy activity? Not holy activity to save myself, but holy activity because I've been saved. This isn't new for Paul in Ephesians. He's already said this to us. Where did he say it to us? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. We are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That's the having done all. Paul says to the Philippians, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. One of Satan's schemes is to immobilize God's people. Maybe Satan can't destroy you. Maybe he can't get at you finally because you belong to Christ. But, but listen, if he can immobilize you, he'll take that. If he can bind you up in fear or in despair or in exhaustion, he'll take that. Battling Satan is not merely hunkering down and weathering the storm. It is doing both those things. It's hunkering down and weathering the storm by leaning into what is good. By refusing to be immobilized based on Satan's deceit, but by leaning into what is true and right and good and holy and pure and reasonable and all the things that Paul says at the end of Philippians 4 and says, put your mind on those things. Sometimes on a really black day, and, and man, if you've ever battled with depression or if you've ever battled with just being overwhelmed in life, you know this. Sometimes on a really black day, just getting out of bed might feel fearful. It might feel downright risky. But if you get out of bed in faith, that's a good work. That's standing against the evil day. I was listening to a podcast, I think it was just last week, and I was reminded by a sister in Christ on this podcast about one of the best considerations of Christian living in light of gospel truth. And she, she put it as a statement. And her statement was, do the next right thing in faith with excellence for the glory of God. At any moment in the day, do the next right thing in faith with excellence for the glory of God. I'll turn the statement into a question this morning. The sort of question that we ought to ask ourselves when we are battling with the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places in an evil day. Okay, regardless of what has come before in this day, regardless of how I'm feeling right now in the moment in this day, regardless of what I'm fearful might be coming in tomorrow, what is the next right thing for me to do right now in faith with excellence for the glory of God? Let that be a question for you this week. As you live strong in Jesus and in the strength of his might. Let's pray. Father, we can preach and we can hear so often far better than our hearts can encompass and then our wills can live. So Lord, I preach this this morning with a bit of holy, I trust, fear and trembling. Because I know the weakness of my own flesh. 
And yet I'm not called to fix my eyes on that. I'm called to fix my eyes on Jesus, who's the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, and whose strength I need this week. My brothers and sisters need his strength this week. Some among our number here this morning, Lord, need your strength for faith in the first place. They need to be brought to the end of themselves, regenerated by the Holy Spirit, and given power to believe the gospel. Oh Lord, would you do this work for us? Would you do this work in us? Would you help us this week to take up and put on the whole armor of God? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.